Hey everyone, I'm here with my friend Eric, and we met two years ago in Florida, and I was blown away by his knowledge of the plants. He's been foraging for about a decade, and he is a plant wizard with really seemingly infinite knowledge. I know there's things he doesn't know, but it seems like he knows pretty much every plant that we cross. And so I've been blessed to get to learn from him. I've been uh, with him for the last day in Maryland and learned so much. And so I'm excited he is going to uh, share some of his favorite plants to help you get foraging. And first he's gonna introduce himself a bit. My name's Eric. I'm a plant lover, permaculturist, and an avid forager. And I'm just really grateful to be here with y'all today and share my top 10 wild edible greens for the mid-Atlantic. And there's just such an abundance of food in these fields and forests. So let's go see what we can find. My number one all-time favorite wild edible green has to be Urtica dioica or the mighty stinging nettle. Uh, there is a native North American species as well, Urtica gracilis, and also Laportia canadensis. Um, I love it for so many reasons. It offers all kinds of amazing medicine. Its flavor is incredible. It can be absolutely prolific in the wild, and it's very easy to cultivate for those of us who are gardeners. Uh, not to mention it'll grow in full shade underneath of black walnuts for the permaculturists out there. Um, it can be made into dried green powders or uh, blended up into pestos, or it can also be steamed and sauteed. Um, any kind of heat will deactivate the stinging hairs and make it edible. Um, but yeah, definitely my number one all-time favorite has to be stinging nettle. So number two on my list of wild edible greens has got to be chickweed. This is another great friend uh, to really connect with and bring into the kitchen. Um, so this is Stellaria media. Uh, common name is chickweed. And I love this one because it's pretty easy to identify. It has these really cute little star-shaped flowers on it and opposite leaves. It's really cool and juicy and... Um, the flavor is really awesome. Uh, it's one that I do like to cook because it's a little bit higher in the oxalic acid department. Um, but it also makes a great pesto and can be dried into powders. So yeah, I would definitely say number two on the list is chickweed and, um, keep an eye out for this one in the spring and fall. It'll disappear in the summer. So number three on my list is lamb's quarters. This is one of the first friends that I really got tuned into when I was first starting to eat something wild every day. Um, the Latin name is Canopodium alba, and uh, it's just an absolute superstar from the spinach family. It's one of the most nutritious plants on earth. It's also one of the highest wild greens in um, oxalic acid. So this is one that I definitely uh, like to cook it up. I like to steam it, boil it. Um, pan fry it, uh, anything to help cook out and denature those oxalates. But after that, it's an absolutely flavor-packed, incredible edible. This is one that should be in all the four-star restaurants, and it should definitely be on everyone's plate. So Canopodium Alba, Lamb's Quarters, number three. Number four on my list is definitely Dandelion, Taraxicum officinale. Um, this is one that most everybody's probably already familiar with. It is an absolute incredible edible. Um, the leaves are great in salad, but they can also be boiled to remove some of the bitterness if you're not into that. Um, they are loaded with all kinds of nutrients, tons of vitamin A, um, and they're the second highest source of boron of any of the wild greens, which is cool because boron helps to detoxify the body of fluoride. So... It's definitely an important one for us to bring into our diets. And it's also a great one for helping to support the liver health and helping our body to detoxify in multiple different ways. So uh, dandelion is definitely one for everybody to tune into and bring home to the dinner plate. Coming in at number five is Aliaria petiolata, the garlic mustard. So this is a biennial plant in the Brassicaceae family, the mustard family. Um, like the first four on our list, it's 
and it's a European import that is very weedy and prolific. And this one, in fact, uh, is alleliopathic, so it competes against other plants in the area. And for that reason, I really love encouraging people to consume these kinds of plants that are exotic to our region so that we can help native habitats to thrive a little bit more, take some of the pressure off of the native plants in that way. Um, this one was brought over from Europe because it's very highly nutritious, uh, 190 milligrams of vitamin C per 100 gram serving, which is very easy to consume in a batch of pesto. And that's definitely one of my favorite ways to bring garlic mustard into the kitchen is in pesto form. It also makes a great cooked green, sauteed, or um, even steamed up, or uh, you can boil it when it gets older to take some of the bitterness out. So yeah, definitely number five on the list is Alieria petiolata garlic mustard. So number six on our list is basswood. This is the American basswood, Tilia americana. And this is a native tree in the mallow family. And I love this one because we don't get to eat a whole lot of tree leaves. And this one is so mild and has such a nice flavor that it can actually be the basis for a salad. And I love greens that we can eat raw. It also makes an excellent green powder, makes fantastic sauteed greens, steamed, any way that you prepare it. Basswood is absolutely incredible. And the leaves also have this nice kind of mucilaginous quality to it that I think really helps to keep us hydrated in the summertime and also makes for a wonderful tea when we've got a sore throat. So yeah, definitely number six on the, on the list is basswood, Tilia americana. So for number seven on our list, we have another tree leaf. And this is one that I bet a lot of you are already familiar with because it is world famous for its berries. And of course, we're talking about the mighty mulberry. So in the mid-Atlantic, we'd be that would be either uh, Morris alba, which is the Asian species, or Morris rubra, which is the native one. Um, they both have edible leaves. Uh, there is um, an introduced species, uh, Browsonidia papyrifera, that is a look-alike that's worth looking into. It's called the paper mulberry. It's in the same family, but um, not as edible. And uh, this one, it's not as, some of them are acceptable as a salad crop, but more so I think of mulberries as being great for green powders or cooked greens, either steamed, sauteed, or otherwise kind of cooked down a little bit. And um, yeah, I love mulberries because they're so easy to identify and they're so prolific and they have these deep roots and they're just beautiful, amazing, awesome trees. So number seven is the mighty mulberry, Morris alba, Morris rubra. Coming in at number eight on our list is purslane, Portulaca oleracea. And uh, this is a really great cooking green. Um, it can also be added raw to salads. The flavor is great. It is kind of high in oxalic acid, so I do prefer to cook it myself personally. Um, but I have heard of people adding it to smoothies. It's got a little bit of a sliminess to it that adds a great mucilaginous kind of throat coating quality to it. And um, one of the other things that's amazing about this plant is it's remarkably high omega-3 fat content. So um, this is a great source of omega-3 fats from a local wild, uh, you know, plant-based source. So yeah, definitely, let's say number eight is Portulaca oleracea purslane. So number nine on our list is Asclepius syriaca. This is a native perennial that grows in open fields all throughout the country. Um, this one is absolutely incredibly delicious. It's important to boil this one twice because it does have cardiac glycosides known as cardinalides in it that are pretty toxic. So I like to boil it um, in two changes of water. Another thing to be aware of with this plant is that it looks very similar to another native that is poisonous and that's dogbane. Um, so this is the dogbane right here, and you can see that they obviously grow in the exact same habitat. And uh, so superficially, it can be difficult to tell the two apart, but when you get into the core of it, you can see 
The inside of the milkweed is hollow, where the inside of the dogbane is solid. And so that's a very key distinguishing feature that makes it easy to tell the two apart. Sclepia syriaca, number nine. Coming in at number 10 on our list is the Mighty Bidens, Beggar's Ticks, Spanish Needles. Um, and with this one, we'll go ahead and say the entire genus. As far as I know, every species is edible. Some are definitely better than others, I've noticed. Um, this one in particular is Biden's Frondosa. And this one is a great weedy summer superstar. Um, it's in the Aster family and has a little bit of kind of bitter sappiness to it. So I do prefer to either boil or steam it before using it for pesto, but an absolutely incredible cooking green loaded with nutrition and also has a medicinal component to it as well, being very popular as a uh, gentle but effective antibiotic. So yeah, and um, the common names beggars, ticks, and Spanish needles are a reference to the seed. And so that makes these very easy to identify. And uh, you'll see them all over the place once you start looking for them. Number 10, Bidens. So thanks so much for taking the time to get to know my top 10 wild edibles for the Mid-Atlantic. And I uh, wanted to give a special shout out to definitely Rob Greenfield and your team. Thank you so much. Definitely want to give a lot of love to the folks at MetaCreative for helping me with all this filming and putting together all the shots and scenes and uh, just making this whole process so much more approachable for me. Thank you for your help and patience. And definitely wanted to uh, give thanks to the Reed Center in Middletown, Maryland, Chesapeake's Bounty in St. Leonard, Maryland, and Plant Path Nursery in Knoxville, Maryland, for hosting some of these video segments. And uh, yeah, so thanks so much. Peace. I hope that you got a lot out of this video and can now implement these things into your life. Eric is a plant educator, an earth lover, and a permaculturist with so much knowledge to share with us. Check the links in this description to follow him. And make sure to subscribe to this channel where there are many more inspirational and educational videos to come. I love you all very much and see you again real soon.